I guess you've all met, for those of you that were here Thursday, you met Dave, Dave Austin, and he's an independent researcher and engineer. And I don't know if I told the story, but uh, I first met Dave, uh, I think it was last October, we had an IVC Academy out at the Reardon Clinic proper on campus there. And I was going around introducing myself to the participants and so uh, when I got to Dave and I said, in what field of medicine are you in? And he says, I'm not in the field of medicine. I said, oh, really? What, what brings you here? He says, well, I've written a book on IV vitamin C. I says, what kind of, what field are you in? Oh, I'm an engineer. And so uh, that began the conversation and we've been talking ever since and uh, what we're going to be talking about today is uh, one of the chapters in the book is, it's called Succeed. And hopefully you'll understand where it's coming from. But the goal of it was to take IV vitamin C to the next level in terms of why uh, continuous IV vitamin C may have therapeutic advantages that we're currently not utilizing. So Dave, any other comments on that? Um, just only that uh, um, it has been a phenomenal opportunity for me. When I uh, first spoke with um, uh, Dr. Ron, uh, I just thought, you know, I wanted to learn everything that I could. I, I thought I'd taken the material as far as I could um, and, uh, would, and ho hope that maybe I could get some more information. Um, and Dr. Ron has uh, been uh, so gracious and, and helpful and beneficial. And uh, since then, we've been able to collaborate, and it has just been an awesome opportunity. I think, I think we've taken it to the next step since then, and, uh, and what we're going to present to you today is the result of that collaboration. And this is about the right time in the seminar, because, or the symposium, because we've covered so many details, but yet this is the area that I think deserves more exploration. And so it all stems from the fact that we had this strange thing happen, however millions of years ago that it was that, uh, or whatever the period of time that it was, that the, uh, the, the gene changed. There was some kind of a mutation or change that resulted in our inability to convert glucose into vitamin C. And so this has been the human dilemma and yet here we all are sitting here having evolved from our ancestors and they have all been successful. So there's something that we're doing right, but maybe part of the issue is, is that we've been able to survive because the planet itself and the environment itself has been friendly enough that we could make do with just getting our vitamin C from an external source. But maybe that is changing. So uh, I'm sure all of you know about the l galonolactone oxidase uh, uh, enzyme and the importance of it in terms of uh, making vitamin C. But uh, since we don't make it, we, we have to fall back to the RDA, right? And you all know what the RDA stands for. That's the ridiculous daily allowance uh, for vitamin C. And uh, it's enough. It's, it's one of the few areas in life where we're just trying to barely get by. You know, everything else in life, we want to have better this and optimal that and the best house and the best car and the best kids and everything, except for vitamin C. We want to just make it the absolute minimum. And so we do seem to get by, but as we look around and what we've learned so far in this uh, symposium is that there is a tsunami of chronic illness hitting, and, it's, and I don't think we've seen the worst of it. And so uh, we, we are at a point in civilization where, uh, as one of, one of my friends said, he was, we were talking about this, and he says, well, humans make vitamin C. And I said, they do? And he says, yeah, we make it in the factory, and we uh, put it in capsules, and we stir it in. We make it but we, don't, we have to take it in order to get those really high doses. And uh, Linus Pauling always referred to the, uh, to the goat as being the, uh, the best uh, vitamin C synthesi synthesizing animal on the planet. And, 
And I always show this slide as a way of demonstrating to audiences that intravenous vitamin C is not as absurd as it seems, that in the animal world, when there's tremendous stress, there is the capability of gearing up to make quite a lot more. And so what we may actually be uh, dealing with in our culture now is what Erwin Stone called uh, hypoascorbemia, just that it's a genetic disorder that we all suffer from, maybe to different degrees. Dr. Levy's revelation that uh, maybe there is a way to rejuvenate, and maybe we've all, maybe there's always been people that ha have the ability to make some vitamin C. Uh, the, the story of the, uh, the, the sailors that leave and uh, with you know, three ships and uh, you know, 120 sailors, and they come back with 30 sailors because all the rest have succumbed to scurvy. Well, why didn't the 30 succumb? Maybe there is still capabilities to, to make more vitamin C, but it's a minimal amount. It's still uh, at a level that it may not get us to the point to where we need to be in order to deal with cancer or to deal with uh, Lyme disease or people who are so seriously ill that they need more than what uh, can be provided uh, by just oral, uh, oral dosing or even supplementation of small amounts. So Dave, I'll, I'll let you start to talk about Succeed. Yeah, so, so basically the, the idea behind Succeed is, is that we, we want to be able to get to a situation where we can do what we did, say, um, 100,000 years ago and uh, our ancestors, that we were able to, uh, at one point, manufacture our own vitamin C. We can't do that yet. We found um, uh, Dr. Levy has, has pro, uh, provided us with some fantastic information that looks like that we can, uh, would be able to um, improve upon that, and there's some great science behind that. In the meantime, we can perhaps uh, simulate that sort of thing. And um, there's really two advantages behind doing that. Um, versus just doing the bolus doses that we do right now where you just go fast and furious and give them as much as you can in the short, shortest time possible. Um, <clears throat> so we're really talking about continuous IBC. And the two advantages are that we can this way prevent um, patients from regressing in between tr treatments. And we see that pretty much uh, almost in every field of medicine. Um, the idea is that uh, the, the patient is going to uh, be healed while they're there in the clinic. Um, they go home and they get worse. They come back and, and we, we make them survive in the clinic. Well, uh, we would like to fix that issue to where they're always healing. The other one is we want to be able to leverage a, new, a newly discovered or recently discovered um, anti-cancer uh, mechanism of IVC. Um, that first one, continuous therapeutic vitamin C, prevents patient regression in between treatments. Uh, the example of this that you see here is with regard to cancer, but it's really with regard to just about any disease here. Uh, in between the treatments, these, these spaces in between treatments um, is when the disease comes back. In fact, there was a um, recent uh, systematic review of uh, 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 I think a couple hundred different cases, um, studies of, in oncology, they said that surviving cancer cells proliferate during the intervals between treatments, and thus, in this process of repopulation is an important cause of treatment failure. And I would say that's the case with intravenous vitamin C as well. So just to kind of state it as simply as possible, you know, we. Hopefully most people in the room, if not everyone, knows that high-dose vitamin C is effective, at least to some degree, in uh, killing cancer cells. Uh, Dr. Chen's presentations, Dr. Nina, we, we have good evidence that something good happens when they get that bolus of vitamin C. But let's say we, we knock out 80%, uh, or even with a chemotherapeutic agent, we knock out 80% of the weaker forms of vitamin C, the ones that are susceptible to what, whatever mechanism is working with vitamin C, 80% is knocked out. But the ones that survive, it's a survival of the fittest. And the fittest cells are left behind to replicate 
and now they become the more dominant types of cells, cancer cells that are there. It's, it's kind of a similar analogy to when the doctor says, take your antibiotic for, you know, for your pneumonia or whatever it is, don't miss doses, be sure and finish the prescription so that you have pretty much knocked out all the, uh, the, the, the more potent, uh, more serious uh, you know, uh, bacteria, pathogenic bacteria. But if you do a kind of a half a job of, 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 of taking your uh, antibiotics, you may have a, a colony of resistant cells that's in, just going to proliferate into a, an even harder uh, infection to treat. That's right. When we do intravenous vitamin C, that uh, intravenous level stays in the millimolar range where it's really doing its best work for only about, at, at the most, six to eight hours. And that's if we do a large amount. So if, if we do it every two or three days, then the bulk of that time, they're not getting that benefit. So how much more benefit would we get if we could keep it in the millimolar range throughout that whole time? And that's what we're talking about. So we're talking about a, a situation where conventionally the, the patient is going between losing and winning. They, they come to the clinic and they win. They win for about six to eight hours. They go home. They feel good usually for about a day or so. And, and all of you have been there. Um, it's usually about a day or two and they get tired and their old symptoms come back. The quality of life issues start going away within, usually within 24 to 36 hours, and then they're losing again. So we want to be in this where we're keeping them in the green and they're always steadily pivoting toward greater health. So the second advantage is uh, the continuous therapeutic vitamin C leverages a newly discovered IVC anti-cancer mechanism, ATP depletion. It's also known as the, it's, it's where we target the Warburg effect. Yeah, uh, Dr. Chin's, again, Dr. Chin's and uh, Dr. Nina's presentations basically tell us that the best evidence that we have is that IV vitamin C, and we won't go through the whole mechanism again, but that it depletes ATP through PARP and the various mechanisms, and uh, it results in uh, apoptosis occurring or necrosis, for better or for worse. These are not always the best ways that we want cells to die. We'd rather have the cells go into apoptosis, but either way, it's an ADP, ATP depletion in cancer cells that uh, seems to be doing the job. An ATP depletion really is what we're calling succeed. Succeed is short for sustained cancer cell energy depletion. We want to leverage this. In the past, whenever you've done intravenous vitamin C, the reason why is that the thinking was that we're going to destroy um, cancer cells just, just by ROS damage. And um, we're just going to pummel them to death because they don't have catalase and good cells do. Well, there's more to it than that. We do have this ADP, ATP depletion. And um, basically, by doing this, leveraging it, we're going to starve cancer to death. Now, when you talk about starvation dynamics, dose is not the critical factor, it's duration. Um, and as, for example, if you, you talk about a soldier that's 90% starved to death, and then you give him a mill, he's 100% better. How often do we do that with cancer? And I, I think it's pretty often. Um, so really, all it takes is a little bit of metabolic fuel for that cancer to be resurrected. Um, you can't starve anything to death in six hours. This could possibly take days, weeks, maybe even months. The, the real key here, however, is to be continuous. And also, you know, this, this, uh, this idea of continuous IVC, it's, uh, it's not really taking anything away from whatever adjunctive therapies, whether you're talking about ketogenic, you're talking about aerobic exercise, better sleep, uh, adequate nutrition. It really is uh, another more effective way of using IVC. We think, you know, this is really an idea at this point. It's not been proven other than uh, we will show you that the proof may be the resurrection of the data that Dr. Reardon uh, accumulated uh, after Dr. Pauling died. 
Dr. Reardon wanted, we started RECNAC, and Dr. Reardon wanted to at least replicate what Dr. Uh, Dr. Levy, excuse me, what Dr. Uh, Linus Pauling and Iman Cameron were doing in Scotland. Most people, when they heard that, that these doctors were giving 10 grams of uh, vitamin C IV, at least this is what I had assumed all along, is they were sticking 10 grams in a, in a small bag of uh, water, ringers or whatever it was, and dripping it in over maybe 15 or 20 minutes. But no, this was, a, this was continuous infusion for 10 days, 10 grams a day for 10 days. So they were doing continuous infusion. So Dr. Reardon did replicate that at the University of Nebraska in people who were in stage hospice patients that had pretty much uh, everything else had been exhausted at that point. And so then he used more than 10 grams, but he was still giving it continuous IV. And so what was published was the phase one data, which basically said it was safe, other than you have to watch out for low potassium and a few things that he, they pointed out in the paper, it's safe. But we, uh, Dr. Nina uh, contacted one of our early uh, researchers and he still had the complete set of data and that's what Dr. Nina was reporting on at the end of her presentation. Yeah, so there have been about a dozen studies that have demonstrated that ATP um, is depleted by vitamin C. Of course, the first one that we have listed here um, is the one with uh, Linus Pauling. Also, uh, Abram Hoffer, he, he did a very similar kind of uh, protocol where that he had tremendous efficacy as well. And we've had a difficult time reproducing the kind of results that they saw back then. And we've always wondered why there have been a lot of missteps since then. And really digging into the data, into the study, see what they were doing. It looks like the continuous nature was probably the most important part, that they were utilizing this ATP deple depletion that we really kind of ignored for ever since then. Um, since then, a lot of these studies have discovered um, exactly how it works. Uh, Dr. Cantley uh, there at Cornell says the vitamin C selectively kills by targeting GABPDH. This leads to an energetic crisis and cell death. Um, and Dr. Lasanti says doxycycline. Um, it basically shuts down the oxphos path to energy. Vitamin C shuts down the glycolic pathway to energy, effectively starving the, um, the, the cancer population. Now, these, these are um, stem cells, they're cancer stem cells. Uh, vitamin C was 10 times more potent than 2DC at targeting cancer stem cells. And uh, 2DC is the conventional medicine to kill cancer, or cancer stem cells, so this is 10 times more effective. And this occurs through NAD depletion. Right. And so this is the famous uh, depletion of that ratio, the 700 to 1 ratio of, uh, of uh, NAD to NADH. And so, so uh, we've, as far as, you know, doing oral, uh, an oral effort to create these kind of levels, I have, uh, I created a slide that I will hope maybe help all of you. It was really, I created for myself because uh, having uh, spent most of my time at the Reardon Clinic, we've always talked about serum pla or plasma vitamin C levels at, in terms of milligrams per deciliter. But when you start uh, talking uh, around the world and talking to various uh, scientists about it, the, uh, the micromolar and the millimolar dosing of vitamin C is probably the more appropriate way to think of it. And so, uh, so I'm going to try to explain uh, this, uh, these phases, the phase one, phase two, phase three, phase four, and phase five uh, levels of vitamin C that are typically, we're typically uh, uh, attempting to shoot for. So in phase one, uh, when your, your, your plasma levels of ascorbic acid are low, less than 70 micromolars, or about less than 1.2 milligrams per deciliter, uh, what will happen there in order to prevent scurvy, the renal transporters will actively reabsorb ascorbic acid. However, they, 
the oxidized form of ascorbic acid, dehydroscorbate, is not reabsorbed. So as, as soon as you lose your dehydroscorbate, it's, it's gone. Now your glutathione and your intracellular uh, uh, enzymes can, can rehabilitate uh, and restore uh, dehydroascorbate, but that takes energy and you have to have the cofactors in order to, uh, to do that. So, but this is how people can, uh, how, how people who are uh, on long sailing trips or how our ancestors survived when their, when their vitamin C levels dropped is that the kidneys were able to reabsorb. But once you get greater than 70, um, the the uh, vitamin C is rapidly excreted. And this is similar to any other small water soluble molecule. So this gives us a, uh, a phase one and a phase two. And if you're single dosing vitamin C as uh, Mark Levine did, uh, the upper limit, the tight control is that it's, it's about around 220 micromoles per liter. Uh, that's, and so between the uh, 70 and 220, we could call that a phase two where ascorbic acid is uh, rapidly excreted. So that phase two, the, the, the half-life of that phase is about 30 minutes. It, it, when, you, when you build up your vitamin C, it just doesn't stay in that phase very long. So uh, probably most of us are spending a lot more time in phase one than, we, when we real, than what we realize. And so that, and you can exist in phase one from anywhere to eight to 40 days, depending upon how your other nutrition is. But uh, it, it's, uh, it, this is how our ancestors were able to uh, survive uh, scurvy. Now, just to kind of put it into the range of where our lab was, just to kind of uh, let you know how uncommon it is for people to have decent levels of vitamin C is, uh, uh, with about 6,634 fasting vitamin C levels, you can't really come to the Reardon Clinic without getting a vitamin C level, uh, only 50 were greater than the 120, mi this is fasting, than the micromoles per liter. So typically people are in this phase one, I think more than what we, what we realize. And it's enough to get by but it's, it's not enough to demonstrate the really exciting things that higher doses of vitamin C can do. But this kind of shows you that, that that particular range of what we call normal at the, at the Reardon Clinic is about one, at the low is 37 micromoles per liter, and the high is about 120 micromoles per liter, or what we, we used to say 0.6 to 2.0 milligrams per deciliter. But I'm trying to get myself to think more and more in uh, micromoles and mini moles, uh, millimoles than, uh, than I have been in the past. So, uh, so dynamic flow versus saturation, this is a concept that uh, Steve Hickey has he was critical of these Mark Levine uh, predictions because those were computer predictions. And he wanted to show that if you do multiple dosing throughout the day, you really can exceed that level. Uh, and, and then, of course, it doesn't take into consideration the liposomal forms of vitamin C. So if you dose your vitamin C every three to four hours, you can exceed the, uh, the two and a half uh, life, uh, you can, yeah, you can get into a phase two uh, and, and exceed that, uh, that, 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 that upper limit. So this is where people are uh, spending more time throughout the day in the 70 to 220 range. But you have to multi-dose, or if you take liposomal vitamin C and get it to absorb into the lymphatics, and it will circulate in the lymphatics for a longer period of time. So that's another way of maintaining uh, vitamin C levels. And so then uh, Hickey proposed that by using multiple large doses of liposomal vitamin C, which, which is very mo much more friendly to the stomach, which does not cause diarrhea and upset, that it's possible to possibly get into an even a phase three uh, to go above the, the so-called tightly controlled upper limit and to reach a phase three. And so he uh, and a friend of his uh, actually did this experiment where I think they, they took 36 packets of liposomal vitamin C 
and monitored their serum level, and they were able to get above, in a consistent way, the, the 220 uh, upper limit of phase two. So I, we call this kind of phase three, but you really have to work on it. You have to really uh, keep it going, and it's not common to, to stay in the phase three range. You know, you're doing multiple dosing, bowel tolerance dosing, frequent liposomal packs, so it's kind of hard to keep yourself above that 220 limit, but it is possible. So this is what he called the, uh, the dynamic flow di uh, definition that you're, you're using intervals of about five and a half lives and uh, using progressively higher doses. Now, oh, if you do that for uh, months and years, Erwin Stone had a friend, uh, his name was Joe Kiniger, back in a 19... 82 letter to St. Gorgie, he, he noted that this gentleman was able to have a blood level of 32 milligrams per deciliter, which is 1,817 micromoles, or 1.8 millimoles per liter. And so that's what I thought would be an example of a mid-dose. So, but he, to get that, he, this, this Joe had to take 80 grams of ascorbic acid a day, and he did that over a two and a half your period. Anyone here taking 80 grams of vitamin C orally per day? I mean, that's a job. It's a job. And so, but it is possible, but you have to really retrain your system to do it. So the mid-dose is possible orally, but we really can't expect patients to do it. We're not going to see, I mean, we have a hard enough time as it is getting patients to take oral vitamin C. They'll do their IV vitamin C. We tell them to take at least their 4,000 milligrams of vitamin C. But uh, the multi-dose protocol that Dr. Levy has in his books, we, we, we actually do promote that. The question is how many people really do it. And, and so this is what we're dealing with. It's not so much compliance, it's just total inconvenience, and especially if they have guts that are not very susceptible to vitamin C. Yeah, yeah in addition to that, uh, cancer patients, they really burn through their vitamin C quickly. They're really using it all because uh, of the damage that they have in their body. And, um, and I did a, a lot of research with uh, people who actually had cancer that were trying to get their vitamin C levels up as high as they could. And they have a much hard, harder time. As we know from uh, before, you know, 30% of cancer patients will have their vitamin C levels below the scurvy level. And, um, and so a lot of the numbers that are done to show how high you can get your blood levels with oral consumption are done with LTP people. So with someone who's in cancer, it, it might not be possible at all. I, I know it works for myself that I could, can get above 220 just with oral dosing. Last year, um, when I, I came to the uh, symposium, um, I had mine tested. I wasn't doing liposomal or anything like that, but I was sick, and so I was taking tons at that time. And uh, the results came back, and mine was 352. So it's possible to break that ceiling. Now, I've done it a lot before. I've been doing mega dosing for a very long time. And, uh, but again, yeah, it's, it's probably not reasonable to expect that it's gonna be that beneficial. A lot of your cancer patients are, they don't feel well, they're, they, they don't have much of an appetite, they've got a sensitive stomach, they, uh, they are not always as motivated as, just because they're so tired. And so it's a problem. So this is where we start talking about, can we provide uh, IVs on a continuous basis in between the bolus? We want to continue, we're not giving up on the bolus of IV vitamin C, but can we do continuous IV vitamin C in between? And this is not a new idea. I think, it, I think did, was it Michael Gonzalez that proposed and the uh, pulsing, using, uh, giving a high dose of vitamin C and then having the patient come back four hours later and then pulsing them with smaller doses to try to maintain the higher dose. And that's certainly one thing, but you can't really send a patient home on that type of a protocol. So this is again just re re going over the fact that Cameron and Pauling uh, we're, we're using this, uh, and again, there is the misperception that they, they, they gave it as a bolus, a small bolus, but actually it was by continuous infusion. And of course, Mortel uh, at the Mayo uh, did not actually replicate the studies, and so, so really it was an unfortunate event. So we've 
So the, uh, we, the, you're all aware of the vitamin C pharmacokinetics that was uh, published in the Annals of Internal Medicine and that, again, the, the, the idea that maybe there is a, a ceiling unless you give the, uh, the vitamin C by IV. But what this does tell us that when you give it by IV, even 1.25 grams, you're hitting uh, 885 micromoles per liter. Let me show you that. So, uh, and then uh, as we heard uh, on, this, on, on sepsis, they're only using 1.5 grams IV every six hours. So they're getting into this mid-range, this close to one millimole or 1,000 micromoles per liter. And so there's something about that dose that is uh, effective and, and maybe we can use it on a continuous basis. So this is just that, that same da data that, uh, that Dr. Fowler presented as well. So now what we're talking about is filling in that, that yellow zone. There's a kind of a red zone there between uh, 450 and uh, 1,000 that it's, it's very hard to hit unless you're taking tremendous amounts of vitamin C. But if we would, were to do it IV, on a continuous basis, uh, the thought is we could hit that bid dose continuous with continuous IV vitamin C. So how do you do it continuously? Uh, really, you've got to use an ambulatory pump. Um, and, and the reason why we stopped it after uh, Pauling's study was because it just became too, too expensive. Uh, back then, people could stay in the hospital for a long time and it wasn't nearly as expensive as it is today. It's just not possible to do the way he did it. You have to have an ambulatory pump, pump, and there's really two kinds. There's mechanical pumps and there's elastomeric pumps, and there's advantages to either one. Uh, the, the main advantage of the mechanical is, is mostly that it's, it's cheaper. Um, and they've, they've done studies where uh, people have used both, and uh, overwhelmingly, uh, people who have, have used both where they can use both, they always prefer the elastomeric ones. Typically, you have to use the mechanical pumps in the hospital, and, and so far we've had a difficult time finding hospitals that are even willing to let us give IV vitamin C in the hospital. So it's another reason that we're looking at these ambulatory pumps. So uh, these are Dr. Oh. Ron's results. Yeah, so uh, last Friday, knowing that the conference was going to get started, I thought it's, it's and, and, and following Dr. Reardon's uh, dictum that d never do anything that you weren't willing to do on your own, I thought, hey, uh, Chris, our, our head nurse, was able to get an elastomeric pump, and uh, we, had it, we had them there, ready to go. And so uh, what I did is uh, I agreed to, to be on a 48-hour pump and to find out just what kind of levels would it give me. And so I did the bolus of, uh, of, of vitamin C, 25 grams, and finished that in about 35 minutes. And so that, uh, that bolus in the post-IVC uh, put me in the 10 millimole range. And so this is you know, 10, 20, 30, this is what we're typically uh, hoping to achieve with our bolus infusions, 25, 50, 75 gram IVC infusions. And so the question was, what would happen if I was then hooked up to a pump? Would I be able to stay in a reasonably high level for 48 hours? And so is Chris here? I, don't, I think he might be gone. And so what I'm pretty sure we used is we, we put uh, 25, we put a 25, a vial of 25 uh, grams of vitamin C into the elastomeric pump and we diluted it so that I was getting about 500 milligrams an hour of vitamin C by continuous infusion. And so you can see, uh, I finished my IVC at 1042. We hooked up the little pump. I've got some pictures of what that looks like coming up here. And my, uh, my first one hour later dose was 4.88, so about five millimoles. So it had dropped down to about half of what it was, so we still had some of the effect of the IV vitamin C. And then at 12.45, 12.48, it, it had dropped further to 3.7. And by 3.40 in the afternoon, it had dropped, uh, excuse me, at 
12, it had dropped down to 2.7. So you can see the effect of the, uh, of the bolus was starting to wear off. But it's still a pretty good level of vitamin C lasting for maybe a little bit longer. We need to take a look at, there's a lot more research that needs to be done. By, uh, by about 3.40 in the afternoon, just before the clinic was going to be closing, uh, and I was going just on the basis of the pump alone, and the pump, is, elastomeric means that there's a little valve that will only allow five uh, mLs per hour, so it's a constant rate of infusion. There's a, there's a, a, a balloon that's a, a bladder in there that's kind of keeping constant pressure on the fluid, so it's, it's dripping in barely slowly. I had a forearm, uh, a 24 gauge catheter in that Chris had put in very nicely. It was not painful unless I jerked the wrong way or, or moved too fast. But generally it's no different than a patient who's in the hospital. And, and this way I was not pushing any pole around. I basically had the, the tubing uh, coming out my sleeve here and going into my front pocket. So I was able to, to get a lot of work done and I was able to go home, I was able to sleep. There were no problems. It was like a little friend that I was carrying around, a little CPO, and feeling good that I was getting, I was just wondering, what is this really doing? Because at these points, I really didn't know what my blood level was. I was doing the glucometer readings. You can see over, over here, this is, these are the glucometer readings. So my, my uh, glucometer reading, which was a fasting reading, was uh, 94. After the IVC, it was 235, so you can see the, the effect that we tell people. I, I had had nothing to eat, so this was the vitamin C. An hour later, it was 233, 166, 137. We, I'm not taking these numbers just real seriously. At this point, I just wanted to kind of see where that was. So the next morning, uh, one of our uh, venipuncturists volunteered to come in, and uh, we were able to take a look at my serum, uh, she drew some blood, and I think really, I think the pump must, the tubing must have been kinked because it gave me a really low level. I didn't know that at the time, but when when the uh, lab result came back, it was uh, it was four milligrams per deciliter, or only about uh, 227 micromoles, which is not that great. And I, uh, I didn't know that at the time, so the experiment went on, and so she came back the next morning on Sunday morning and the uh, serum glucose was 22. So remember that when I left the clinic on Friday, it was 26 and it went to 22. And so it was about 1.25 uh, millimoles. And so that's above the one millimole mark. So for, for basically assuming that that one on Saturday was some kind of an error, uh, this is at least a, a little bit of preliminary evidence that we can maintain a serum level above one millimole per liter with a continuous infusion pump that, that can be worn. And so you can kind of see, uh, if you can see those, uh, those dots, we were able to, s I dropped down fairly quickly, but I was able to stay right around the one millimole range. And I had essentially no, no further complications. Actually, by the second day, there was no, I didn't even know that the, uh, that the, that the catheter was in my arm. I just had I'd gotten, kind of gotten used to fooling around with the, the tubing, and so uh, there were no real problems, well tolerated. I had no symptoms. I was not tired. I, was hope, I'm, I thought I might have a little bit of visual clarity, which I sometimes get when I'm on a higher level of vitamin C, but no other problems slept fine. And so, uh, and so the, the, you'll, you can comment on that, Dave, about contraindications. This kind of actually is a safer way to give vitamin C. Yeah, it's, um, you know, there are a few con contraindications with bolus IVC. Um, the most common re reported one is fatigue. Um, some people have that dry mouth effect. Um, and, uh, and there's the, a lot of it related to having the glucose uh, transporters occupied. Um, but with this, uh, you know, we have throttled down the dose by a factor of almost 50 compared to when you're, you're going fast and furious. So uh, much, much, much slower. Um, as a result, uh, it is, is my belief that uh, we will have probably none of these contraindications that you normally have with bolus IVC. Um, if, if you're G6PD deficient, it may be possible that with this, we may be able to do without that test. So there are situations where, you know, uh, 
It can, it, it, for people that are, we have a, quite a few Lyme patients that are showing up at our clinic and we give them the, the daily IV vitamin C, but it sure would be nice to send them home with IV, continuous IVC uh, on a pump. Same, same idea that you wanna, while you've got the, uh, the viruses or the bacteria or the fungi or whatever is the infecting agent, while you've got it down, uh, keep it down. And this is what the strengthened immune system was something that Dr. Nina uh, definitely noticed is that they, there was uh, the uh, neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio was improved. Uh, was there one other thing that we noticed? Yeah, yeah the, oh, the, the, there, the, 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 I'm going to let you just tell them real quick what, what you, what you observed. Uh, when I analyzed data, which we previously did not really analyze, I was really impressed. And what was amazing about this study is that Dr. Hugh um, uh, measured one week or 10 days before for this patient's parameters, then exactly uh, before uh, treatment and several times during treatment. So you can look at dynamic, how parameters were changed. And what we found, <coughs> neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio before, 10 days before, was higher than during treatment. We found uh, this uh, group of patients were very, very sick. They were after all chemo and radiation treatment, and uh, they have very low level of absolute lymphocyte count. Two-thirds of them had uh, severe uh, leukopenia. So lymphocytes were improved on 60% for people who, for patients who had low level. And what was also amazing, we measured uh, LDH, and this parameter indicates the higher this value, the more uh, severe disease and less uh, survival of patients. So this parameter was improved in 40% and stay stable in 30% of patients. For this group of patients, it was an unexpected result. Also, um, many patients had high level of glucose, and it's also uh, before uh, practitioner noticed that cancer patients have uh, increased level of glucose. Increased level of glucose was decreased. So they were, they were less uh, stuck in glycolysis as a result of this. And so that's, it, it was a trend towards improvement. But that's just continuous. There's no bolusing in this. So you can start to see if we combine the two, a kind of a hybrid IV vitamin C approach, we're getting the best of the bolusing and we're hopefully gonna get the best of the continuous infusion. For, for most cases when we do the, the boluses, that's really to generate a large amount of hydrogen peroxide. Um, it's really mostly for cancer. And for when we use intravenous vitamin C, for most other cases, you don't really need to go that high. And, and the reason we sometimes do is really so you can leave it in the person, it'll be in the person's bloodstream longer. So um, really, when it comes to all the non-cancer uses for IVC, this may be a better uh, so, uh, suited solution. So um, there's a number of uh, things to consider when it comes to, to duration when you're doing this. So yeah, we're, we're, th this, this is the key issue. Our, you know, how, patients ask, how am I doing, doc? You know, how many IVCs do I need? And more often than not, it's a limitation of where they're living, how far they're coming, do they have access to additional IV vitamin Cs? But if they can come and spend time with us, it's, it, it might be possible to set people up for a three, four, six week uh, period of treatment where they would be more aggressively treated but comfortable uh, at the same time. They wouldn't have to be hanging around the, the, the clinic. They could go out for walks. They could go back to work. They could go do something else because they would not be uh, tied up by the, uh, by the IV pole. Yeah, you know, if you look at the, the data and the research that's been done with uh, hollow fiber tumors, uh, usually um, it takes more than a day or so to see some significant loss 
uh, of the cancer cell. Um, you know, a lot of factors that you want to think about is what, what's it going to take to reach tumor saturation? How long? Um, you know, normally it's a PET scan visibility decision that helps us understand what's IV going to be able to hit. If, if we do continuous, that's going to be sitting in the blood for a very long, and in the body for a very long time. It's possible that they might be able to permeate tumors that otherwise wouldn't be, other, otherwise be able to, to do that. So when, you know, we'd be looking at how long do you treat a specific uh, patient, it's really kind of a patient by patient call. It, it also comes back to Dr. Levy's presentation on uh, using high dose vitamin C for viral infections. Uh, the Lyme syndrome patient is probably the most difficult patient that we see next to cancer. And uh, the breakthrough came when those patients began to start doing the high dose vitamin C every day, every day, every day, really pounding away at, at the, uh, the virulence of the, uh, of the infection. So, but though, that's pretty tiring and, and it's kind of hard on them. It would be nice to have where they would bolus and then have the continuous IVC and they, they would be able to participate in additional types of lifestyle therapies. They're, they're not just tied up to an IV pole. They can, they can do more exercise. They could get other forms of uh, uh, therapies. Yeah, when we're looking at doses and where this falls within the IV, IVC ecosystem, um, we have a number of ways of looking at it, but this, um, this line down here is basically if you're doing it orally, and then if you're doing liposomal, you can get this, and this is a logarithmic scale here, you can get it up into the, the 500 millimolar range. Um, with the Succeed protocol, we could get it into that millimolar range, uh, up to a couple, th maybe three millimolars. And then if you combine that with the bolus treatments, you're really setting a situation where the cancer is just constantly pummeled. And, um, you know, I, I think this particular graph doesn't really tell all the story for liposomal. Um, you know, theoretically, it'd be, and I don't see any reason why it wouldn't be, if these liposomes are still intact when they're in the bloodstream. Um, and if, if one of them deliver a solid uh, intact liposome to a cancer cell, that's for that cancer cell a much higher concentration than you're seeing here. But, you know, <clears throat> there's, uh, there's a lot that we don't know whether that is really happening. And probably we wouldn't stop oral liposomes or oral vitamin C while they're doing the, I, I think we would be, uh, we would just be using multiple ways uh, of giving IV vitamins, or giving vitamin C. Uh, you know, Dr. Levy's in the multi-C protocol talks about five different ways. He's talking about potential sixth. This is a potential seventh way of really saturating that person's system with uh, vitamin C. Yeah, some other dose factors to, to consider. You know, we were looking at, um, at uh, anywhere from 0.25 to uh, 2.5 grams per hour, depending on a lot of factors, the patient wellness, their illness severity, the kind of conditions that you're treating. Um, but what we know is that you need, at a minimum, 1,000 millimoles just to permeate the body, and this is, this is a slide that um, Dr. Nina used. In order to, to get all the tissues, you have to get to that, um, uh, I'm sorry, one millimole. One millimole, yeah. which, is, which I was able to do during yeah. this little experiment. Yeah. yeah, with just 0.5 grams an hour. That's really not very much. Yeah, this is just showing, that uh, this is a slide that I'm sure you've all seen, the selective cytotoxicity, and this is uh, what I show patients in terms of how we uh, come, came up with, the, well, how Dr. Reardon came up with the 350 to 400 blood range, just because this is the level that we, that we, we, sh we showed does cytotoxicity uh, in, in vitro. But he did a very interesting experiment. I don't know if enough people know about this, uh, but I really liked this experiment. I thought it was very innovative. He took uh, in vitro prostate cancer cells, and then he took a gentleman who uh, was a friend of the center that had advanced prostate cancer, and uh, he basically gave that patient a 60 gram IV vitamin C. And so the, the bar here, at, at, at time zero 
is uh, blood taken from that patient and uh, put with the in, in, vi in vitro cell culture of prostate cancer cells. And as you can see, there's 100% survival of the prostate cancer cells. And then uh, after, I believe it's uh, 36 minutes, he took blood, 36 minutes into the 60 gram infusion, and I don't know exactly what rate he was giving it. I'm gonna expect it was our standard 500 milligrams per hour. But uh, 36 minutes into it, he took blood and put that patient's blood onto the uh, auger plate with the uh, prostate cancer cells. And you can see a 100%, almost 100% inhibition of growth. And then, of course, at the even higher blood level, which is up into the, this, this first one was in about the 28 millimole range. This one was in about the 36 millimole range. And so every, about every half hour, they drew blood. And you can see, even when the blood level was coming down, it was still high enough to totally inhibit the growth of that, that cancer cell. Now, as it came down further into like the 10 millimole, the 20 to 10 millimole, there wasn't complete inhibition. So there are some tough cancer cells in there that are withstanding the effects of this high dose vitamin C. These are the guys that we want to go after. We don't want to let them get back again. So I think it's this is why the bolusing, periodic bolusing is just as important as the continuous. So this hybridization of IV vitamin C therapy, we think may be a, a at least theoretically a good way to approach uh, difficult cancer patients, along with melatonin along with hyperbaric oxygen, all the various strategies that we can bring to bear, uh, inter the, uh, uh, anything that, that, that would be beneficial, dietary changes, but it just becomes another tool in our tool bag to help these people. So this is just, re just showing you once again the different, so uh, we're hoping to keep the, uh, this, uh, what we're shooting for somewhere in the lower end of what I'm calling this uh, phase four, mid-dose continuous IV vitamin C versus the phase five, which is your high-dose intermittent vitamin C. And this is just my data. And so this is just some pictures that I had the staff taking me. I was holding my, my little uh, elastomeric pump. And you can see here that it's, uh, it's about the size of a small softball. And I could, I could go ahead and put it in my coat pocket and just carry it around and do things. You can see in this next slide that I'm, I drove home with it. Uh, I did not name it. Uh, <clears throat> they're, they're drawing blood to get my blood levels. Uh, I'm wa now when I took my coat off, I'm kind of walking around with it. I can kind of hold everything in my left hand and do things with my right hand. But Dave's got some pumps here that I think are, are going to be even easier to use, this is just the, uh, this, you can kind of see on the left there what uh, a deflated elastomeric pump looks like. This was by the end of the, uh, the 48 hours. There was still some vitamin C in it, but it was pretty well gone at that particular point. And uh, let's see, here we go. And so this is just uh, where they're removing the, the catheter. Yeah, so when, uh when we were first looking at this as a possibility and hadn't really dived into the data and, um, and we hadn't really discovered even the Nebraska study that uh, Nina found for us, um, we were thinking that was probably gonna, we were gonna need somewhere around six grams an hour or something like that. And there was some information that seemed to suggest that might be the case. And so um, I never set out to design a pump, uh, but none of the pumps seemed like it would be able to be feasible uh, to be able to deliver that. Now that it looks like in many cases we wouldn't need that much, um, we don't need as large of a pump, <clears throat> but nonetheless I did my design and came up with a, a better design. The, um, the pump that, uh, that can be used is, uh, like uh, Dr. Ron used, um, it just expands in all directions. And if you're gonna do one that would last, say, maybe for a week or so, you're gonna have a pretty large pump. Some that's gonna be bouncing around, you're gonna need it in backpack or something. Even the one he had was about the size of a softball. Um, that's a, a 200 milliliter, and this is a, a 200 milliliter that, that we would use. It, it works on a slightly different principle, and it results in a, a, 
a flow rate that is much more consistent, has a, a number of other advantages, but um, you could actually put it inside your shirt, along your arm, some, something like that. Um, so it, it's something that can be very compatible. Um, we also have the, a larger ver a version. This one actually wraps around you, and uh, such as you see in this picture here, um, the runner has it in, a, in basically what's called a runner's belt. Um, so not bulky, not obtrusive, um, <clears throat> and and this is um, and if you combine this with uh, the bolus treatments, you know, this is what Dr. Ron calls a hybrid. IVC, where we're doing the combination. And this is basically a, um, a depiction of the cancer cell count over time. Your cancer cell is actually going to go up over time. And when they do chemotherapy uh, or intravenous vitamin C, if, let's say in this case they're doing about 12 sessions of it, each time cancer comes back. In the ideal situation, you're just going to knock that cancer down. But what really happens, as Dr. Ron said, you're educating the cancer, the, the strong survive, they become resistant, and you actually develop a refractory cancer. And so that's what we're trying, trying to prevent here by adding this low dose. What you're seeing here in this graph is the amount of vitamin C that someone is getting. And there's a pulse each time they, they go and get their uh, intravenous vitamin C. If you add, add low dose on top of it, you end up with a much better situation. In the normal case, which you see in the white line here, the recovery actually gets worse over time. But if you can, um, if you can do this low dose, then you can actually improve their recovery throughout the whole, um, whole treatment process. I think this just describes that yeah. same process there. Same with their patient recovery. Usually, um, and, and this particular graph was done using conventional, looking at conventional chemo, where it really uh, ends up hurting uh, the patient. Um, if we add in the situation um, where the oncologist doesn't want to do bolus treatments, they may be okay with you using uh, a continuous low-dose IVC. And what you would get in, uh, in that case is that you would improve the quality of life, and you should be able to improve their uh, rate of recovery. The other thing about having this is that we probably need to become cancer patient, I mean, not probably, we, we must become cancer patient educators. And that takes time, that could be in other venues, that could be in groups. And if, if this were developed properly, because I'm, there's, I'm, just, I'm just sure there's going to be more and more chronically ill patients coming, up, coming down the pike, this uh, uh, kind of, they become a semi-captive audience. They're not just coming in for IVC. They can actually move around and we can have them, we can put them in cooking classes. We can have them do more vigorous exercises. They can do different body work and whatnot all the while they're still getting their IV vitamin C. There's a psychological dimension to it as well. Uh, having this in my arm and knowing that it was vitamin C going in, there's something about that that I think is psychologically reinforcing. If people know anything about the vitamin C, that they're getting a continuous infusion of the vitamin C that's gonna make them stronger and help them beat the cancer. Yeah. So an example protocol would be something where they would get a midline uh, most cancer patients will already have a, a pick line. If they don't, they can do just a midline. Um, this is it's just like a regular intracath, except it's just a couple, like an extra inch or two longer. And those are designed to stay in the arm for uh, up to three, four weeks. And they can, they can do that. Um, it's, it's not as invasive as a pick line. Uh, Dr. Ron, just, you just used a, a regular uh, intracath. Yeah, it was just a t number 24. Uh, one and a half inch or one inch uh, inner calf, and mm -hmm. it, it was stable the whole time. Yeah, and and um, so basically they just do a bolus, um, and at the same time, or, or right after they're done with the bolus, uh, the practitioner would give them a, um, the continuous pump and send them home. And <clears throat> people in your community would go home and go back to work, and the yeah. whole idea of being sick with cancer 
would be transformed uh, into more of here's a way that you can be treating it all the time and not lose that nat natural home life, uh, that home identity, that wellness identity that so many cancer patients feel like they've, they've lost their way. And this is a way to kind of help them rebuild their way back, putting them in, into different learning situations or at least having them go back home or uh, whatever they want to do. And it's, uh, it's really not a big deal. It's a pretty common process. They do with the pain pumps a lot. Someone will have surgery, they'll fit them with a pain pump, which are the same kind of pump. They're an elastomeric pump, and then they send them home. And um, those people who do them, uh, they hardly know it's there. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting to take a shower. You kind of got to hang it somewhere. But for the most part, they don't even realize uh, it doesn't really affect their lifestyle at all. But, but with this protocol, you know, they just repeat this a couple times a week. Um, uh, they're doing their periodic lab tests, and when things look good, they're done with it. There's, uh, of course, all the same integrations that you would use for intravenous vitamin C would apply um, for, for the bolus treatment would apply here as well. Um, just some information about the pump that we provide. One of the things that makes it different than any of the other pumps out there uh, this can be manufactured as a multi-vessel pump, and it has uh, pulsing possibilities just by the way it's designed. Um, this way you can have one channel that would be intravenous vitamin C, another one that might be some sort of complementary drug, an anti-cancer drug, an anti-inflammatory, maybe an oxfos, inf oxfos inf inhibitor by, like doxycycline. Um, you know, you could do me uh, melatonin for uh, one of these uh, channels. Um, so there, there's a lot of different ways it can be used. Okay. And, and it, it also can be designed so that um, it, it can provide a scheduling. And, and pr for example, what you have here is uh, this is, is one day where you have four different uh, substances that it's providing them. And, and it will actually pulse the, um, the substance that they need at that time. So we have worked, uh, we've been working on an IRB. We're still kind of putting this together. Uh, we we, we ob obviously need to do a phase one study on it. Uh, it. Hopefully in the near future, we will be recruiting patients. Um, we've already have patients request, they've heard about it already somehow, and they're requesting it. Um, so, uh, we wanted to make this group aware of it, uh, just that that this kind of research uh, will be happening at the Reardon Clinic. We've even talked about this might be, uh, you know, we had RECNAC1, and then that evolved into RECNAC2, and then it's kind of laid dormant for a while. We're, we're hoping this would be uh, a part of a RECNAC3, and there are obviously other dimensions to this. Uh, some, of the, some of the stuff that we've learned this weekend certainly uh, opens my mind to a number of ways to enhance the quality of care that uh, IVC cancer patients are receiving. I think that's all. Yeah, that's it. Any questions? You know, it, it makes, me, makes me think a little bit about uh, a, an observation I've seen just simply by accidental observation. Uh, yeah, over time, and, uh, and that is Normally, you know, with the chemo, so I'm using chemo, so it's a cytal agent, similar to the vitamin C. Normally, I don't know how you guys are, but, you know, I started off doing this uh, with the cytal treatment until I could see, like, maybe nothing on the scan. Okay? I think that's wrong. Do you, do you get that? Yeah, okay. So, because accidentally I found that all I want to do is see a response, and then we stop it. Wait a while, and that while could be three, four months. And then come, up, come back, bang, do another little interval, and that way uh, I haven't seen any resistance develop, and I'm getting a lot better results, rather than going for that home run right off the top. Yeah. I, I get your point is that maybe we have been uh, allopathically brainwashed into thinking that we have to stamp the evil cancer totally out of the body rather than thinking that cancer is us. It's just a, it's a dysfunctional set of cells 
that are doing the best they can to survive in a bad environment, and if we can improve the microenvironment of where that cancer is, those cells go dormant, they go quiescent. And your point is, uh, which is a really uh, kind of a, uh, and, and um, it's really an amazing idea to think that, wait a minute, this whole notion that the American Cancer Society has put out that the war on cancer, maybe we don't need to be making war at all. We maybe need to be making peace. <laughs> and, and then that way we are able to co coexist with these cells. And in, in the meantime, continue to do everything we can uh, like Nasha has done with her, her tumor. She's got a really interesting story. But that, that tumor is in a quiescent state. It's there, but it doesn't need to grow because the, the factors that make it grow are no longer present because we have changed the microcellular environment and we've probably changed our macrocellular environment as well in terms of all the things we do to take care of ourselves. That's a good point. Tom. We also generated a little thought here. We know, for example, that it's going to sound completely unrelated when I start out here. We know, for example, that virtually all heart attacks come from pathological organisms in the mouth, root canals, etc. But we also know that many, many people that have root canals don't get heart attacks now from the work of Dr. Broda Barnes, where he showed that out of 1,500 patients, adult patients got all the diseases, undoubtedly had tons of oral infections. Over 20 years, when he tightly controlled thyroid function, there were four heart attacks. The Framingham study showed there should have been 80. Okay, point being is, my speculation is, what allows you to live at peace with your cancer and it not metastasizing is very similar to what allows you to stay at peace and not metastasize a focal infection in your mouth. So I think as a part of cancer therapy, I would suggest strongly that these people get tightly balanced T3, reverse T3 numbers. Thank you, good, good, here we go, yes. Uh, that's really interesting that, that that Dr. Levy would bring up infections because that kind of segues into my remark over here. And, and of course, I'm going to say something that sounds crazy again. Um, but uh, uh, a, a few years ago, um, I started really getting into um, a lot of a lot of this stuff. And one of the things that that I started learning a lot about is. Um, you know, invasive pathogens that, that originate in the gut. Um, we have a uh, hundred trillion organisms in our large intestine, so I thought it would be smart to start paying attention to that. And the chart that you showed us over here in this slide presentation that shows how the cancer almost adapts to treatment and adapts to threats in its environment, it, it looked identical to a uh, training presentation that I had with one of the specialists from biobotanical research about a month ago, maybe two months ago. And um, we were discussing the, the spirochete Borrelia and how it kind of turtles up and reacts to perceived threats and how it eventually forms um, a biofilm community to protect itself from um, uh, antibiotics. And we know that candida does that. We know that just about every bacteria and fung fungi on the planet does that. Um, and the methodology was to attack the organism subversively over time and to not give it that huge, massive push of the botanicals, to do it very, very slowly so it doesn't perceive it as a threat and to damage the, um, the, uh, the efflux pumps that the organisms have. And the chart, as far as how it reacts, was identical to what you showed us. And that leads me to uh, something that I, I read a long time ago that really got me interested in this, and that was um, something called the germ that causes cancer. And it was a... Doug uh, Kaufman. Doug Kaufman. Um, but you see, I didn't really buy it. 
You know, I gotta be honest, I didn't really buy it. I thought it was really cool and it was something to explore. I thought it was interesting how certain antifungal medications like Diflucan seem to have had a tremendous effect on reducing, reducing certain tumors. And then, in 2016, I was actually working in a, in a clinic as the nutritional consultant for a physician, and there was a patient that came in that said, that, and this was his story, he said that um, he was diagnosed with lung cancer, and he was an older gentleman in his 70s, and he, his daughter, who was a microbiologist, and really, really tied into really very advanced laboratory testing, which you guys do, she said, I don't buy it. So she had him tested, and they found out that he didn't actually have cancer. He had an invasive candida infection in his lungs that looked identical to cancer in all the screenings. And at that point, I was convinced. And after seeing this over here, I think that, it, that one of the things that we need to do moving forward is start looking at cancer as if it's not um, like just some sort of abnormal cell gro growth, uh, it actually is a pathogen. Yeah. No, I don't disagree with you at all, and I think that that kind of fits the same model in, in the sense that if you, if you, you know, we know from curing the incurable how, how well uh, high-dose vitamin C controls infection. And so, the, and there are a number of people that do believe that the spores from fungi do nest themselves into cells waiting for the right uh, circumstances to, to emerge. And so we're just basically trying to get ourselves out of those, quote, right circumstances. Health is the best treatment to prevent that from happening, rather than trying to kill every spore that might be nesting in your cells. It's, it's just, not, it's impossible in the environment that we live in. It's just impossible. So, so again, we have, to, uh, we have to optimize the immune system, optimize our detox systems, optimize, 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 kind of work towards uh, healthy beings once again. But this, uh, I think the continue, you know, we do have patients coming to us uh, who are very advanced and very, very far down the road. And, and whether or not these can, this can provide saves or not, I, I was encouraged by uh, Frank Schallenberger's discussion of how he's working a lot with really advanced patients and that he can stabilize them. So this would just be another stabilization tool at the very worst. There is just uh, one question I'd like to ask. Uh, I use vitamin D3 at 10,000 units, K2, 100 milligrams, for uh, a lot of my cancer patients. And I've had some of them say to me, too, where they get, are beginning to get a raise in calcium, whether that rise in calcium is coming from the cancer itself or from the involvement of bone, they say, well, why take vitamin D3 that it uh, increases uh, the level of calcium? My answer to that has been, and I don't know if I'm 100% right here, that it doesn't increase the calcium, that what it actually does is just promotes the deposition of calcium in bone. So I'm just wanting to say, am I correct in keeping them on the, the vitamin D and the K2 when their calcium levels are rising? And the second question that I have to ask, is there any situation, would there be, you mentioned on the first day about calcium channel blockers, would there be any advantage in giving a person whose calcium levels were rising uh, calcium channel blockers while watching for the blood pressure changes? Well, first of all, I would say yes, continue the K2 and the vitamin D3. The answer to the second question, that's my speculation, but I would tell you that uh, we have the data that shows calcium channel antagonists, long-acting, interestingly, not short-acting, but long-acting calcium antagonists do decrease all-cause mortality. So I've, I've often said, not completely jokingly, that uh, it's probably the only truly beneficial prescription drug and is worthwhile even take it like a vitamin if you prescribe it for yourself and you don't make yourself hypotensive. So. Thank you. So we're kind of opening up here now. Uh, we've got s several, if not most, of our speakers still here. 
Uh, so th if there are any questions that are lingering in your mind, we've got some time to where we can explore that again. All right, I've been, uh, my question is to most of the speakers in this room, um, how do you feel about consistent testing of G6PD? Um, I've heard mixed information where you test the patient once before therapy and then they've never tested it again. Um, I have the experience from a clinical standpoint. I've seen uh, G6PD consistently decline over two years in one of my cancer patients. I've also seen in two cases where my G6PD was low and we supported nutriently, we did a gut repair, decreased inflammation, and in six months, it was above the limit where they could start IVC. Have you ever had hemolysis with any of your patients? No. Yeah, uh, yeah. Dr. Levy has some feelings on that. I can let him address that. I thought you were going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> this is basically all speculation, okay? However, as a brief review, G6PD deficiency results in increased oxidative stress inside the red blood cells, which means when sources of more oxidative stress come in, they could be prone to hemolysis. Now, first of all, the G6PD deficiency, except in some groups, is really quite rare. And I think at the Reardon Clinic, you've seen three or four positive tests in how many years? 31 years. 31 years. However, <laughs> In the medical legal environment we have today, and the fact that uh, the loyal opposition has their fangs out all the time to make us suffer, by all means, routinely check the G6PD. Now, if it's positive, there are a number of approaches to take, and I would suggest one of the best ones is to take some of the liposomal glutathione uh, such as from live on, and you can get some glutathione inside the red blood cells, bring the intracellular oxidative stress down a titch, okay, and then proceed slowly with increasing doses of vitamin C. And if the intravenous is not absolutely needed, you can do oral vitamin C, regular vitamin C, or liposome encapsulated vitamin C, and really in very, very many patients get the same desired outcome. Furthermore, a little bit of patient counseling is important here because you need to, in the patient that has a positive G6PD, you need to sit down, talk to them and say, look, you have a condition where sometimes, rarely, Something can cause some of your red blood cells to rupture. I want you always, when you're in the office, take vitamin C in any form. If you urinate, check your urine. If it's dark, let us know right away. And then you immediately go to a, a normal saline infusion, high volume, with a little bit of Lasix, and you're fine. I want to reiterate what you just said. Uh, about, as you guys probably know, ozone therapy uh, will, it's an oxidative stress, you know, so it'll cause hemolysis. I've seen uh, two cases in my life of this in the office, and, and both of them worked out just fine, because that's what we tell them, exactly what you said. We just put them on saline, and that was the end of that. Uh, so I don't, I think it's probably a, a lot, lot of big deal about nothing, in a sense. Uh, about two years ago, I, um, emailed all the colleagues I know around the world that are supposed to be experts in ozone and asked them, do you check G6PD? And none of them check G6PD anyway. Uh, we have had about three, three. Give them the same scoop that we said about, if you're in the office, always let us know. If your urine changes, doesn't matter whether you know if they're G6PD or not, you're going to treat the potential negative outcome the same way. Well, also, the, the, uh, the thing is, it's been published data that if you got somebody with G6PD, give them a teeny bit of ozone, and you'll build it up. Yeah. You gradually tighter them up, and, they'll, and after a while, they'll have a normal level of G6PD. Ozone is magic gas. It really is, yeah. <laughs> okay, yes, go ahead. I just have a simple question. There are those little um, strips that you can test vitamin C with in the, um, the urine. Yeah, Vitacheck C. Yeah, yes. are, are they 
Are they really good? Did yeah, yeah. I mean, they uh, basically, it's a way of, when, when I have new patients and they're saying, I don't know how much vitamin C to take, I'll say, well, titrate your dose up until your urine strip turns yellow. And it's just a, it's a measurement technique that gives them something to, you know, judge their actions biased. Because that's always the, the biggest question I get. Doctor, am I better? Am I getting better? What, what, what should I do? How will I know when I'm taking enough? And this is one of those things that you can use with patients. Also, what's nice about it is I say, you know, for the first few weeks, use it every day because every day is not going to be the same for you. Some days you're going to have a high stress day or maybe you're going to be exposed to more allergens or certain things are going to happen. And that day, the same dose doesn't turn it yellow. And so you're going to need more that day. So it's a, it's a way of getting people to learn how to manage themselves better because self-care is the essence of where we're really trying to go with people. Does it correlate with the serum levels? That, that it, 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 they, I get, I've had a lot of patients, I, I don't want to make it complicated, but different people have different thresholds. We have some people that have a very low renal threshold for vitamin C and it turns yellow really easy. Some people they have to take a quite, a, quite a bit of it, but the point is, is that you learn what your threshold is and where okay. you need to go. Typically patients, when they first come in, it's almost always green, which means that they don't have enough because they've been fasting. And if you fast in the morning, your vitamin C level is not going to be high enough to reach that threshold. So it's only in, only after you've eaten some good food or taken enough vitamin C that it's going to start to show up. So they, they check it after they've taken the vitamin, what, 30 you, minutes later? Yeah, wait a little bit uh, because, again, there's going to be that 30-minute peak, half-life. And so, you know, all of this comes into play. Pharmacokinetics, the patient's individuality, what did they have to eat, how much stress are they under, did they smoke a cigarette? You know, all of these things can adjust that. So you're using this measuring device to help them get a handle on their uniqueness. Okay. Uh, Dr. Ron, one thing that uh, Dr. Jackson had noticed um, when he developed those strips that some medications will cause the kidneys or maybe the tissues to lose vitamin C more quickly and therefore dump. Uh, things like um, um, aspirin um, especially would cause that. So you may be doing things that could cause your kidneys to dump or tissues to dump into the bloodstream that would then be available to be lost. So just because you're seeing a le a, an increased level, there is not a good correlation to plasma level as you were asking. What it does say is you've got vitamin C circulating and it's exceeding your, your kidney threshold. But regular consumption and use of vitamin C can help raise that renal threshold too. So you are a, a living breathing organism, things do change with time. There is, the Japanese have developed a vitamin C, kind of like a glucometer, vitamin C glucometer, where you can use the little finger thing, prick your finger, and get a very accurate, and I think that's going to be a better tool in the long run, and we're planning to use that as part of the research on the pump, just to see what kind of levels we're actually getting with people, depending upon various circumstances of stress, diet, uh, sleep, things like that, because it, because we really don't know enough about the pharmacokinetics of vitamin C. We have some information, but there are people that really think there's more to be learned about vitamin C pharmacokinetics. Hi. Uh, a question for Ron. I, uh, maybe the, uh, for the continuous vitamin C infusing protocol that you talked about, I might be a devil of uh, advocates here. Sure, good. Yeah. So um, in the laboratory, if we want to uh, develop a drug-resistant cancer cell, what we do is we expose the cell chronically to no concentration of that particular drug. So that helps the cell to adapt to the treatment and to develop resistance to it. So I think that could be a potential concern because for the continuous vitamin C thing, we haven't done any, you know, real research into it. So uh, might be a concern. So will it increase or decrease the resistant development is a question. 
That's why I think we would want to do it in the context of the bolus and then the low dose. I would not, I'm, I don't think we want to do just continuous low dose like Pauling did. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, the, uh, the outcomes up in Nebraska, even though there were improvements that Dr. Nina just outlined, the, all of those patients died. And some of them had some, uh, some, one guy had some really improvement quality of life. But I don't think continuous infusion by itself is the answer. To me, it's, it's, it, it becomes something that you can use to make the bolus a little bit more effective and not to lose the benefits of the bolus. I get your point. Uh, the, the, uh, the concern is the continuous exposure. I mean, you keep a level, you know, a base level, and then you give a bonus. That's what you mean. Yeah. But then the, when the base level uh, raised up to like any drug treatment, not only vitamin C, you induce um, genetic and epigenetic change in that cell that to help it to adapt to the same drug. For example, the, uh, uh, for a lot of chemo drugs, they will upregulate the uh, 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 transporter, the pump transporter, uh, will, which will excrete the drug out of the cell. So, um, I mean, even if you add the bonus to it, so your baseline level of elevation of uh, vitamin C there, because it's not a physiological concentration you're talking about anyway. It's uh, like about one millimolar, right? So that's, uh, that's going to generate hydrogen peroxide. That's probably will trigger the cell to upregulate it, its cantonase, its SODs, its other uh, nerve 2, and then glutathione synthesis, you know, all the uh, other mechanisms. Uh, it's a potential concern. Oh, it's, I no, I, I understand, and I, and I think uh, in life there is variability and there should be variability. We're trying to mimic what we think maybe our ancestors had going for them. Maybe it's not that good of a deal. You know, at this point we don't know, and, I, and probably we would only be using it for a certain number of weeks to really help uh, seriously ill patients start to get a handle on their illness. It wouldn't be something, I, I wouldn't certainly want to wear a pump for more than a week or two myself. Just after my experience, it was kind of a pain in the neck and I was very happy to get it off. And I'm sure patients would have a similar experience. And so just in terms of what Dr. Schallenberger said, uh, our goal would be to put, <laughs> put the cancer back, you know, tame it down and, and then let it be and if we saw signs, I, 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 I like Dr. Winter's idea of, of, of looking at the C-reactive protein, the SED rate, and the LDH, and I would add the reverse T3, and there are probably three or four other things that we could put together as a little fairly inexpensive panel that would help us monitor uh, what, what's going on in the body, how well tuned up is the body, and when the body would get to a fairly well tuned state, stop all the vitamin C or something like that so that we, uh, we didn't have it going all the time. But I, th I think some degree of extra vitamin C is probably going to be necessary if you believe uh, uh, Erwin Stone's idea that we are hypoascorbemic creatures and that, that vitamin C is different than a drug, that, that it does work as an electron uh, buffer that can help, help um, uh, maintain homeostasis in the cellular environment. Now, if you take too much of it, you may disrupt that homeostasis. If I might, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I agree that it's definitely worth trying. Yeah. yeah you're, I'm glad you're gonna do a clinical trial on this. Uh, maybe I can suggest if you can take tumor sample or if you can even draw blood, you know, check those, um, antioxidant defense system, see whether yeah. they... Yeah, no, I agree. No, we want to do a lot of testing in conjunction with it because it's a new idea. It may not be valid. So I have... Sorry, I finished and I will be done. Oh, so okay. I have uh, another question. So how do you decide your target concentration to be around one millimolar? So is there any, you know, what's behind it? And then another question is that, because uh, vitamin C in a bag, it's can, it can be oxidized. So how do you keep that? you know, being, from being oxidized. I'll, I'll give that to David. I'm done. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> oh, can I also add, add a couple 
Sure. Uh, first, uh, in this study which we had, um, uh, the average survival uh, was about 100 days, and um, people who uh, finished eight weeks, it was six, eight weeks, they live longer, and one patient, he felt so good that he continued 48 weeks. Wow. Yeah. It was amazing. I even can imagine to be hooked to this pump for 48 weeks. So, um, and um, about this millimolar concentration, one millimolar, we uh, decided that this is normal, uh, probably level. To, uh, according to calculations, not our calculations, it was a study of another group. At this uh, level, uh, there is saturation in tumor. At, at least we have some uh, level, in all cells in tumor have um, uh, ascorbic acid, some uh, which you probably have seen two times today, this uh, circles with uh, ascorbic acid. So this is level at which we have ascorbic acid in um, tumor and if we have ascorbic acid in tumor, we can probably can control hypoxia inducible factor and some other factors. So this is what I would suggest. Yeah, right. Thank you. And um, also, I just wanted to say that, that this is not a new concept. Um, they've been doing this in conventional chemotherapy for quite some time, and uh, they call it metronomic therapy. And uh, they actually pulse it. Um, it's not totally continuous, but they are doing some continuous as well. And we can pulse it as well with uh, the pump, uh, this other pump that uh, I've designed. Uh, normal elastomeric pumps you can't do that with, with, the, with ours you can. Um, and and um, I'm sure ab absolutely that what uh, you've observed, Dr. Chen, um, is the case. Um, I did a lot of study of the con conventional metronomic uh, chemotherapy and uh, it is, uh, for the most part, it's less uh, poisonous to the, the patient, and it's just as cytotoxic, as if not more cytotoxic, and um, it's becoming more and more common, and it's probably, probably will be the case within the, the next five or 10 years that most chemotherapy will be uh, delivered in a, a fashion similar to this. So this is, this is, um, this is not new, it's, um, I suspect that, there probably will be cases where that actually does happen. As, as you know, cancer is not a disease. It's a, an infinite number of diseases that we've just assigned that, that name to them. And um, so each one's going to behave differently. But in conventional cam, uh, cancer treatment with uh, conventional chemo, uh, overall they've seen that it's uh, much more effective. Also, I sometimes, I don't I think I was Dr. Levy that made this observation that life is a sine wave, and whether you're talking about blood sugar levels or heart rate, life is pulsatile. Well, if that's a sine wave, isn't it? So, uh, so I think we have to understand that the circadian nature of life is such that if we got this really well-tuned, it would have that kind of circadian, tw you know, uh, rhythmicity to it. It's music, and, and if we can get it tuned properly, then we're going to have health. Yeah, this is a question actually for you guys. Um, uh, I, I've been intrigued why it is that when you give vitamin C after ozone, it works really well. I mean immediately afterwards. So I'm giving an ozone therapy to my patient. The, I'm loading them up now with lipoperoxides. They have a very high level of serum lipoperoxides, okay? Then I'm infusing vitamin C in. So what's going to happen is I'm going to change the ratio of, I'm imagining, I'm asking, de, uh, dehydroascorbate, I'm going to change that ratio for the reduced to the oxidized ascorbate. Um, and my question is, you, you mentioned if when the ascorbic acid level gets low enough, uh, things change in the kidney. It, it excretes the uh, DHA, and it keeps the ascorbic. So somehow the body is monitoring the levels or the ratio of DHA to uh, ascorbic acid. Must be monitoring this. So, so if that's the case, 
Uh, can you, can, I mean, do you know of any other effects other than on the kidney? The body said, I'm putting in these lipoperoxides, then I'm putting in a mild ascorbic acid, and I'm going to have a, a completely screwed up ratio of DHA to AA, and I'm thinking the body monitors that and then does something else that's really, really good, and that's why it works. Yeah, what, I think what, what do you think? It, yeah, I think it all comes back to cell signaling and that uh, in, in my talk on Thursday, there's one slide. You know, I've always been intrigued with the fact that a pro-oxidant improves the NADH to NAD ratio, right? You, you're, you want oxidation to improve that ratio, yet that is oxidative stress. Why does that help? And, and I, my, my, the thing I came to is that, uh, and why does, why does prolozone work when you're injecting ozone into an in, inflamed area that's in pain? Why does that work? And I think, I think what happens in the, the non-healing wound is the body gets stuck. And when you give it a shot, it, 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 it's kind of like you give it in a little bit of an acute oxidative stress and hormetically it jump starts it back into more of a comprehensive healing response. But I think that happens on many, many levels and maybe at the different cellular level. Now why vitamin C would work, I think the ozone obviously would be coming in as an oxidant. The vitamin C might be the next, that might be the other, the next part of the wave. You know, that, that. that ratio. Yeah, I think the body's monitoring everything. Uh, and it's and and how how it knows how to respond to this is very primordial. That's that's the junk de junk junk d DNA is not junk. It's all it's nine, all that ninety percent of genes that we don't know what they do. I think they're regulatory genes, and and cell signaling is so much more complicated and happening at a local level, and at an organ level, and at an organismic level. All this signaling is happening. And once again, we're just trying to get it all harmonized. And so when it's, when it's just out of, totally out of sync, you have to put some kind of a, uh, of a stronger signal in to restart it back again. That's my only, th it's just theory. I don't know why. Dr. Ron, about ascorbic acid and DHA. When we give uh, intravenous vitamin C and then we try to measure level of DHA in blood, there is no any DHA. DHA lifetime is several minutes. It goes back and forth. And if it loses uh, this ring structure, it is, it's already not DHA, it's already other products and finally oxalate. So um, this is what I wanted to tell that um, probably uh, we don't have this, even in our uh, future study, DHA uh, will not be measurable. In, and I don't think that uh, we can measure its effect in kidney and some other stuff. So uh, we could not measure DHA in blood in any concentration of ascorbic acid. Well, <clears throat> I would, unless I misunderstood your initial question, I would initially approach it at a much more simplistic level and say that whether you're treating a cancer or an infection with ozone, any successful ozone treatment is going to generate a substantial amount of uh, pro-oxidant metabolic byproducts. and. That's, in my opinion, the, the primary reason why you would always follow it with vitamin C rather than precede it with vitamin C. Either one would be beneficial, okay? But I think you would have profoundly more protection and end up with a patient who felt a whole lot better after the whole process was done if they get the vitamin C second. It's a stress, and the adrenals respond to stress. But it's a, it's a boom, boom type of thing, and uh, the adrenals have the highest amount of vitamin C of any other organ in the body next to the eyes, and so I think whenever there's a stress, it makes sense for vitamin C to come to the rescue. It's a rescue molecule. And, and, and I, don't, I don't know if Robert Rowan did this because of my communication or it was his plan all along, but when he officially announced he was gonna go to Sierra Leone to, to treat Ebola, I obviously wanted that to be a fantastic success. So I contacted Bob. I said, look, I said, I have no doubt 
your ozo is going to wipe out Ebola, no problem at all. But these are patients with horribly poor nutrition, and you don't want to have a large amount of pro-oxidant debris in these horribly malnourished people, or you could potentially have some people die from semi-Herxheimer-type reactions. I would strongly encourage you to add some vitamin C as part of the protocol. And he did. I don't know if he, it was, like I said, it was already his plan to do that or not, but he had fabulous results and completely cured three people uh, with, uh, with primarily with ozone and then with a little mop-up oral vitamin C. I think this is why we call it redox instead of like re or dox. It's a red or ox. It's, it's this cycling thing that... It's, it's the essence of life, and yet it's happening on many, many different levels. And I think at a macro level, when you give a pro-oxidant stress to the body, that the, I mean, it's, it's paradoxical. We're giving an oxidative stress substance to the body, but yet it's eliciting a healing response. And if you give the healing substance right on its tail, you're, you're, you're helping the healing response. That's my best way of understanding it. Uh, kind of summary question. Good. <clears throat> so right now in your clinic, uh, when a patient comes to you with cancer, what is your protocol in terms of how much vitamin C is in your IV, 50, 75, 100 grams? How do you judge that? And over what length of time is that IV dripped? And how frequent? I've never seen the same type of cancer patient, doesn't matter what their diagnosis is. And so I, we do have a standard protocol because I, we have to start somewhere. So we follow the Reardon protocol, 15, 25, 50, and do post C saturation levels simply because it's a starting point that we feel comfortable with. And then what happens from there, it depends on what their nutrient levels come back as. I'm, I'm having the nurses always tell me how did they respond, what was their post-IVC saturation levels, what are the therapies are they doing, what are the things do we need to add. So I think it's just a, it's one protocol out of many that I think we need to be thinking about when we're dealing with cancer patients. It's a powerful one. And uh, I think patients feel really good getting it. They feel better. It's amazing how much better they feel when they get it. And so if nothing else, for the quality of life that it gives, uh, it's, 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 it's worth doing. But we do the Reardon protocol. I very seldom veer from that because to me it's like a home base. So then I'm going to wait and see how they respond uh, to this standard protocol. Then that tells me my next step. I've st we've stopped giving the super high doses. We did that experiment. There was a there was a gentleman that that came over to us, and we were doing 125 grams twice a day for how many days? I think it was like 35 days. And uh, we were watching his PSA. We were thinking this, and there were times when we thought things were better. But uh, then, then his assistant left and he went on a fast, of like a three day fast, and we were still giving him the high doses of vitamin C and we had stopped the magnesium for some reason we were gonna try. We were doing too many things and he went very hypokalemic on us. And so I'm just not ready to, to go for the home run in that way anymore. But he was also getting insulin too. He, he, he was getting which insulin. Which will make you hypokalemic. Be, yep, well, we're doing insulin, insulin potentiation without the drugs. But the uh, lesson there was track the electrolytes yeah, on a much more we, regular we basis. We thought we were monitoring him pretty close, but not close enough. Generally speaking, uh, you know, there are people that seem to think that more and more and more is always better, but I'm not one of those people. I think there's a point where you, you get your benefit and, and, and uh, you work within the context of how that patient is doing. And there that, always has to be a mop-up period. The body yeah. has to mop up what you've done and have a period of healing and just pounding with a maximal dose he, a couple he, times a day, every day. He was on not some, necessarily the optimal approach. Right, and he was on some pretty strong anti-cancer drugs, and so there were too many factors. Too many variables, yeah. And and uh, so we don't do that anymore. So I know there are people. Sometimes we'll do a hundred grams if the person, if their if their numbers are showing that they're not getting enough with seventy-five or fifty. But fifty to seventy-five is probably the target we most often aim for. I don't know why I thought of this, but this is a great study. If you guys haven't uh, heard this study, uh, and it, there's a little lesson in it. And uh, this was published maybe three years ago. 
And you know, you know, when you when you got you got prostate cancer and you're on the testosterone inhibitors. Okay? And uh, and then eventually they stop working, right? Okay? So uh, so how can you maintain your dependence? How can the cancer how can you maintain the dependence of the cancer on testosterone? Because after a while it becomes independent. So what this guy did is he took 30 uh, uh, stage 4 prostate cancer patients. Some of them really bad in advance, some of them not so much. And he took all 30 of these guys, and after they were on Lupron for six months, he started giving them a big old dose, and it would be like 800 milligrams of testosterone cypionate, IM, once a month. The idea was to maintain their dependency on testosterone. He's giving them a bunch. So they downregulate all their receptors. Is this clever or what? Um, and and the, the report was at the end of one year, uh, none of them had developed resistance, which isn't a perfect study because it usually takes a couple years anyway. Uh, but the quality of life was a ton better. But none of them had developed resistance, and, uh, and two of them went into complete remission with that kind of therapy. So it's kind of interesting point to think about. Hello. Okay. Sorry. Um, Dr. Schallenberger, uh, this is to comment on the question you asked about ozone and vitamin C. And uh, I had to look it up, but there was this, there's this book called Ozone, A New Medicine. Um, I forget what it was, who it was written by, but it's the... Uh, uh, Bachi, I think that's it. Yeah. Um, anyways, in, one, in his book, he talks about how O3, when it mixes with plasma, it stimulates ROS and um, LOP. And um, there was this. There's a theory by this um, by a doctor named Dr. Chen, who. Uh, says when that happens, it creates, when LOP and ROS happens at the same time, it creates mitochondrial support and it allows for vitamin C to get um, into the intracellular matrix of the cell uh, more effectively. And so it's just kind of an idea. You know what, it's about quarter after five and we, uh, we have a banquet that's gonna be starting around six here, which I hope some of you may already have tickets for. And so uh, I think we are ready for the rest of the students to adjourn school. And so I just wanna just thank all of you uh, for being such a great audience because uh, a good audience makes for really good teachers. And I think we've had it going both ways these past three days. And so it's my fervent hope that you've gained a number of things, more than just one thing. Remember I said, one of my friends said she always hoped if she just learned one thing from a, uh, a medical conference, she felt good. I'm hoping you've learned many, many things. And so, but thank you for coming. And God speed you home. And if, if, if we can be of any help to you, please call upon the Reardon Clinic. Thank you.